Yeah. In Sweden, we have something called the Academisk Kvart, which means like the academic quarter of an hour. <laughs> where you don't really get started until yeah. just after the hour. Usually when it's presential, I have a uh, statistics and uh, I um, um, uh, I am used to start 10 minutes past the hour in Brazil. 80% of the audience uh, arrives 10 minutes after the, the time you book here in Brazil. <laughs> I have a lot of statistics on this, but uh, for uh, internet, so usually five minutes after the hour, they already got the link. Well, where's the link? Here's the link. <laughs> they are trained to go to the website. So yeah. <laughs> in, a few, uh, in some three minutes, they will be here. One more curiosity about uh, Phil Marcel before before the regular seminar. Uh, oh my God! Okay, Phil, oh, I, 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 I I am I am uh, uh, judging the the guys that are going to enter the PhD program, and I'm in another conference here, so I I made my questions for this one. And uh, I will just say bye there, and they'll be back here, OK? okay. So uh, I, I will leave uh, Marcel on the command here, OK, Marcel? Please, please uh, take a look on the popping of the participants. I think mm -hmm. that they should be stable at uh, five minutes past the hour. The, okay. uh, so uh, we, we can start the, the presentation. OK. So, all right. Go for okay. Marcel. You are the chair today. <laughs> okay. I'll be back. Uh, okay, thank you, Miguel. Thank you. Mm. Okay, so I'll talk a bit about me just before a few start in a few minutes. So basically, I'm, I'm located in Natal right now. I'm based in Natal. I'm originally from here. I did my master's degree in the graduate program of bioinformatics at the Federal University of Rio Grande do Norte. So I was here. Uh, I went abroad for a PhD. Uh, I did a PhD in bioinformatics in Sorbonne Université in France. Then I came back to, to Natal now. So I work for Scara, but I still have some ties with the local groups where I did my master's degree. So I still do some bioinformatics research. I see a lot of people from here, for, from the group, like Leonardo, Larissa, João Vitor. I see some people here. Uh, and I think it's a nice example. And you will see another example with Phil uh, about people that did a PhD, did a master's degree. They had an academic career, but eventually they decided to switch to industry. And even keeping some ties with academics, just like few also mentioned. So I think that's a very, it's very nice to show that these examples are real, that you can do that. Because a lot of people, they want to do research, but they don't want to stay in academia. They want to go to industry. And sometimes we think it's not possible and it's totally possible. So I just wanted to give you uh, this example of mine. Uh, as Miguel and also few mentioned, I'm in Natal, so I work for Sequera with Nextflow. So if you have any question about start using Nextflow or porting a pipeline to Nextflow or something like that, feel free to reach me in person in Natal if you want, but also by email or, or Slack or anything like that. Uh, so we have 11.05, so I think we can start, Phil. Uh, do you want me to, to read your bio, your bio or you want to, to, to do it yourself when you talk about yourself in your talk? What do you prefer? No, I'll just do it myself. If, if I'm going to do a quick career background, yep, it's yep. basically the same anyway. Exactly. So. Yep. So <laughs> it's, the, the stage is yours. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Miguel. Thank you, everyone, for, for the invite today to, to come and talk to you. Um, today, I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to talk, I'm just going to spotlight myself as well. Sorry. Um, I'm going to talk about Nextflow and NFCore, um, which are as a workflow manager for doing bioinformatics analysis. And I will go into some detail about uh, what it is and how it works and why it might be useful for you. Um, just now, we were chatting before the meeting started and, and saying it might be of some interest to talk a little bit about kind of my, my career until this point. And, and it's a bit off topic, but maybe I can kind of do a, a slightly extended introduction for myself in case it's of interest to anyone in the audience. Um, I've had a slightly kind of unconventional, non-linear career path and uh, have basically been working in uh, in academia my whole life until this year. So um, I'm from the UK originally, and I did my uh, PhD at, in, uh, at the University of Cambridge, uh, in Cambridge in the UK, just north of London. Um, and I specifically actually was embedded within an institute in Cambridge called the Babram Institute. That's where I did my PhD. 
traditional PhD I worked with epigenetics. So um, I was working with um, 3C, so chromatin organization uh, within the, the mouse and human cell nucleus. Um, and working on the predecessor to what would later become high C, in case anyone has worked with that. Another kind of RNA seq and chip seq and, and all those standard kind of genomics and epigenomics uh, techniques. And I was working in the lab, so I did all my own experiments and everything. Um, during the course of my PhD, two things happened. Um, firstly, I realized that uh, I had been doing web development kind of as a hobby since I was a teenager just making pretty websites and, and later on making a bit of kind of money on the side and just 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 for fun really in my spare time and I realized that many of the coding skills I'd learned through web development were the same as what was used in bioinformatics and also as I started generating my own data I found it was really fun to just analyze that data myself rather than relying on taking it to other people to, to do um, and then the other thing that happened was uh, that my my lab work didn't go very well <laughs> my PhD and so as my PhD went on, I, I and I got more into bioinformatics, that started to take a larger and larger piece of, of my final thesis. And so kind of basically by accident during a course of my PhD, I had this gentle introduction to bioinformatics. When I finished, I realized that that was definitely the direction I wanted to go in. I seemed to be kind of really enjoyed that side of things. And so I started a postdoc at the same institute uh, with, with Wolf Reich, uh, working on epigenetics, again, methylation, DNA methylation analysis, RNA-seq, chip-seq, high C data, um, and I did a short postdoc at the Babram Institute in Cambridge again. Um, and with that, I was actually embedded within a core bioinformatics team at Babram. So I was doing a postdoc, but I was working with a core team who, and that core team did bioinformatics services for the whole institute. Um, and I was very lucky because that core team were super, super talented bunch of guys. Um, if anyone in the audience has ever used a tool called FastQC, for doing QC of DNA sequencing data, and that's developed by uh, Simon Andrews, who ran, ran the group. Um, so I got uh, I, some of my very first open source contributions were making pull requests to FastQC. So uh, about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, probably, as you can find somewhere in the code base some small changes that, that I made there. And, and lots of other nice tools came out of that group. And they had a really good ethos to open source and to, uh, to bioinformatics analysis. And that really kind of shaped my career path. And so when I finished that postdoc, I, I moved to Sweden, um, uh, partly because I wanted to move away from the UK and, and live somewhere different. And also because I, I had a partner who was half Swedish and had just moved here. Um, and I looked around for something slightly outside of a traditional career path because I didn't really want to go down the line of just doing lots of postdocs and becoming a PI. And I ended up joining a place in Stockholm called SciLife Lab. Uh, which is a academic um, collaboration between four universities here in Sweden. And specifically, I worked at the National Genomics Infrastructure in Stockholm, which uh, provides DNA sequencing services to research groups across Sweden. Um, and I worked with bioinformatics, setting up new bioinformatics analyses. <clears throat> um, this is where my, my story of my career starts to kind of dovetail into the topic that I'll be talking about today. So while working at the, the NGI, we were doing lots of high throughput uh, bioinformatics analysis and trying to establish standards and high levels of reproducibility. And I, one of my first projects was to set up um, analysis workflows, which we could use, you know, we're doing maybe 30 to 50,000 RNA samples per year, um, maybe probably double that now. There's huge numbers of samples, RNA-seq, DNA-seq, um, DNA methylation, cancer, chip-seq, all these different types of analysis that we were doing in the lab, and we wanted to be able to process those uh, with a team of about 15 bioinformaticians, so not that many people for a large number of samples. So we needed to automate that and standardize it, and that's how I got into the world of, of NextFlow and NFCore. Um, and then what happened, which was kind of that, that whole project, which I'll talk about in a minute, really took off, took me by surprise, and uh, while I was working at the SciLife Lab in NGI, we applied for a grant uh, with the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. These guys called the EOS grant, a central open source uh, software for science grant. And we're very lucky. We, we've actually had three of these grants now uh, to support NextFlow and the NF Core projects, which I was very heavily involved in at this point. And part of this money funded um, outreach activities and community building. And um, so... This was co-applied co from uh, KTH, which is part of SciLife Lab, where I was working, uh, and Secura. And Secura Labs are a spin-out company that formed out of Spain around the, the NextFlow software, software, which I'm going to talk about in a second. 
Um, and so this is a commercial arm of the open source software. Um, and whoops, Sakira, basically, I was talking to them about this money that we've got. And they said, well, do you want to come and work at Sakira using this grant? And so as of May this year, I've moved now fully into industry. Um, and with still very tight collaborations with the academic groups I've come from um, and still working on open source software and fundamental scientific research. So it's a really quite unique place to be working in a, in a unique job and it's a lot of fun. Uh, and it's been quite a kind of zigzag path to get here and I could never have predicted it. But I think it's a good example of how just working on what interests you um, and not being too tied to a specific uh, career path up ahead, but just taking opportunities as I come, uh, uh, that's really led me to where I am today. And Marcel, who, who introduced me, he's in my team at Secure, and there's three of us. Um, so, and the idea is that I am based in Europe, uh, Marcel is based in, the, in Latin America, and Chris, who's also in the team, is responsible for Asia Pacific. And between the three of us, uh, it's our sole job to try and spread uh, open source community of Nextflow and NFCore and adoption. So it's it, we're here to, to talk to people who are interested in Nextflow and help you get started and basically contact points for the community. So if you have any questions or anything, please do drop it, drop us a line. Or if you need help getting started or you're interested in having training at your, uh, at your institute or anything like that, please let us know and there's a good chance we'll be able to help. Okay, that was a bit of a wordy introduction. So sorry if I went into too much detail, but hopefully that's kind of a bit interesting for you guys. And now I will kick off into my talk properly. So shout if you have any questions or anything, by the way, you can drop them into the chat or unmute yourself. It's no problem. I'm happy to take them as I go along or you can save them to the end. Um, so my talk today is about reproducible bioinformatics using Nextflow and NFCore. So I'll start off with Nextflow. Um, this is this tool that came out of the CRG in Spain and Barcelona, um, and is the kind of the foundational building block of everything else which I talk about. Now, Nextflow is two things really. Nextflow is a, a piece of software, a tool, and it's also a language. Um, and the idea behind Nextflow is uh, that it's a, a workflow manager, which means that <clears throat> when you do a bi typical bioinformatics analysis, you might have uh, a set of samples and you want to run a set of analysis on them. So you might have 10 samples and for each sample, you want to run some basic QC using that fast QC tool I mentioned. Maybe you want to trim your genomic sequencing data. You might want to run an alignment against the reference genome, uh, quantify the reads, and do some downstream reporting, say. Uh, it doesn't have to be bioinformatics if you're not working with genomics. It could be uh, cell imaging data that you need to stitch tiles together, uh, do normalization, denoising. Uh, if you're working on, I don't know, anything really, geospatial data, maybe you need to do some kind of radio astronomy data. It could be anything really. You've got a lot, a lot of data and you need to do some processing on it in a series of steps. And you need to scale that across a number of samples. Now you could just typically run that yourself manually. You could have the commands you type manually or you could put them in a bash script or something like that. And that's kind of fine, but it doesn't scale very well and it's not very reproducible. For any of you who have been working with this field for any length of time, you'll know that going back to something you did two, three years ago when you're writing up the paper, it can be very difficult to remember what exactly you did, which flags, which parameters. And so it's not very reproducible and that's really kind of echoed in the in uh, several studies which have come out in the past years about how reproducible bioinformatics analysis is. So a workflow manager then is a way for you to build this analysis that you want to do basically as code uh, and let the underlying software tool, this workflow manager, uh, handle all the heavy lifting for you. It handles all the interaction uh, with managing the jobs, with parallelization and, and ideally with the software. I'll go into what I mean with that. So when you write a, a Nextflow pipeline, you, you write it in a custom Nextflow language, which is a, a DSL, a domain specific language. Uh, and then Nextflow can understand this language and, and it can run your script that you've written. So it's a language and within that language are processes. So you've got, we've got a couple, about three key kind of bits of jargon here, which I'll just describe. You have processes and each process is kind of a wrapper around a specific step in the workflow. Uh, so you've got three here. Maybe that first one is FastQC, Maybe the second one is alignment, uh, and maybe the third one is reporting with multi-QC, something like that. Each process is a single step in your analysis. 
The processes are then connected via channels, which is a concept which is quite unique to Nextflow, uh, where you have an output of one process that can be an input of the next process, and so you kind of wire them together. And then that whole thing is encap encapsulated within one or more workflows, and that's kind of the whole pipeline. So in code, what does that look like? This is a kind of a very, very minimal, about the smallest Nextflow pipeline I could possibly write. Uh, and this, this workflow only has a single step. It just runs FastQC. And here we have a couple of things you can point out. Here we've got, uh, this is your process. This is your unit of work. And then this is the workflow, which just runs that process. Within the process, we define an input. So it's an input channel. We define an output, which are the files which are expected to be generated, which could be used by downstream steps. And then here we have scripts, and that can be any arbitrary bash script. Could be a Python script, could be an R script, could be anything. And within our script, we have a variable, and that variable is the input channel here. And this just says run fastqc minus q for quiet, so you don't get all the percentages. And this is the input file name. And when we do workflow, we say with our workflow, create a new channel from a path. This is a glob, so saying any fastq files, and then run those into the fastqc process. And then this process, then Nextflow will run this process for each fastq file it finds and run fastqc. Easy. Um, by doing it this in Nextflow, instead of doing it manually, you get a few things for free. Um, Nextflow is very clever about parallelization. So when you run it, it creates this, this DAG, this uh, diastic graph, and it works out how everything connects. And everything that can be parallelized, as in run side by side, there will be. And so it's very, very good at parallelizing things across whatever computes resources are available to make things run as efficiently as possible. Nextflow also gives you something, the technical term is reentrancy, but basically if your laptop crashes halfway through the run or if something like that happens, something fails, you can rerun your pipeline with a minus resume flag and Nextflow is clever enough to know which steps have already finished and it will just use the cache results. So it will skip the first half of the pipeline that's already been finished and just carry on, pick up where it left off. And finally, the pipelines are reusable. And I'll go into a bit more detail about what I mean by this. But basically, once you've written that pipeline, it works with any bunch of FASCI files. And you can just run that same script again and again on different sets of files, and it will just work out the box for you. So hopefully you're with me so far. Ne Nextflow provides a language. We just saw an example of this language, which where we can write our, our workflow scripts. And then under the hood, what where Nextflow really starts to give you value is it connects to underlying systems on your computer or on your computer environment uh, and does all this kind of heavy lifting for you. So by that, I mean, it handles all the software dependencies within a pipeline. So you don't need to worry about installing FastQC, installing Bowtie, installing MultiQC. The pipeline might have 30, 50 different software packages. You don't have to worry about installing all of those because that can be defined within the pipeline and Nextflow will handle those software requirements itself. Secondly, Nextflow talks to your underlying compute system. So that is, you don't have to think about writing, uh, if, you're on AW, if you're on a Slurm cluster, you don't have to do sbatch. You don't have to think about submitting jobs to a cluster and everything. Uh, Nextflow will do that for you. It will manage your queues for you and it will submit all of these jobs and all this parallelization and handle all of the underlying compute interactions for you. And what's really, and so, uh, and the language itself also Nextflow has built in interaction with code repositories. So if you store your, your pipeline code on say GitHub, you can just do Nextflow run and the name of the repository and Nextflow will be able to pull that code automatically for you and run it. So you don't, it was very easy to share your pipeline code with these language servers and you can use basically whichever Git repository you like, GitHub or GitLab, whatever. So if you want to use someone else's pipeline, you can just do Nextflow run and the name of the repository. With software, then Nextflow supports lots of different ways of handling software, but the, the primary ones then are Conda. Um, and then the ones we really recommend are software container systems. So the big one being Docker. And then many of you may be running on HPC systems where Docker is not possible. Uh, you can use Singularity. Also supports Charlie Cloud, Podman, and a raft of other software tools doing similar things. And these manage the software requirements. And then Compute, Nextflow runs pretty much everywhere, really. Uh, if you are running on your local laptop, that's fine. 
if you want to run on an HPC system with a job manager such as Slurm or Grid Engine or PBS, any of these tool schedulers, it will work with that. If you want to run on the cloud with AWS or Google or Azure, Nextflow works with those all interactive like natively. Kubernetes, your own custom cloud with OpenStack, really basically wherever you have a compute infrastructure, there's a very high chance that Nextflow will already have native uh, built-in support for that. So you don't have to think too much about the compute infrastructure. And most importantly, the pipelines you write are portable across any different system. That's quite abstract. So I've got a couple of just more discrete examples for you here. Here's our example pipeline from a second ago. We've got our inputs, our outputs, we've got our first QC script, and down at the bottom, we're running it with our workflow. Now, the simplest way to run this is the commands bottom right there. I'd say next flow run main.nf, which should be the file name on the left here. And that just runs on my laptop. And it just runs it without anything clever. It expects fastq to be installed. Um, and it's kind of the same as running a bash script, really. Now, where the power of Nextflow really comes in is the separation between the pipeline code and configuration files. So now as someone using this pipeline, maybe someone else has written this pipeline, I can write my own config file here on the right and specify with minus C config file name, or you can save it in other places so you don't need to specify the file name every time. Uh, but here on the right-hand side, now I'm saying take this pipeline here, but run it using uh, the Slurm executor and use enable singularity. And so by doing this, then this same pipeline without touching the pipeline code now runs on my Slurm cluster and it uses singularity to provide all of the fast QC software. Um, you, we can extend these config files because that's probably not enough by itself. So maybe we say here on the right that we have a cache directory for singularity images um, and that we're using a queue here and maybe we're using a module environment system to module load singularity to make it available. It doesn't really matter what the details are here. The, the point is I've extended this config file to work with my specific cluster setup. Um, next, that's great. I've been running on my HPC system and I've developed it on my laptop, but now I want to take this pipeline and run it on the cloud. I can do that again. I just switch out this config file here and instead of executor slurm, I now have um, executor AWS batch. Um, and now Nextflow is clever enough. It has built-in interaction with AWS. And it says, I'm going to spin up an AWS batch cluster uh, using this queue name, which I've already myself set up on AWS ahead of time, using this AWS region. And um, this could be, I think there's a region in Sao Paulo, you know, you could have whatever queue. And AWS batch then is this system of spinning up EC2 instances uh, on demand. And because Nextflow knows what jobs it has and knows what requirements they have, it will select EC2 instance sizes and everything and generate this whole AWS infrastructure for you um, with very little overhead. And again, I haven't touched the pipeline code here. Something slightly funny going on in my slides. We'll see what happens there. And so this will run with AWS and Docker. <laughs> Docker is automatically enabled here because uh, I've specified AWS batch. Finally, a bit more cleverness that you can do with, with config files here. Oh, something in the chat, let me just double check. Um, with uh, When I write this, this config file over on the left here, I had previously defined down at the bottom from path and I'd hard coded some fastq, uh, star.fastq. But maybe my friend wants to run this pipeline that I've written and his fastq file names have a different file name, for example. And so now I can go down here and I can switch this out for params.input. Uh, which is a special type of variable. And I can define this in my config as well and have a, the default ones could still be the same, so it still runs the same for me. But now I can have my own custom um, config file, which I overwrite. And uh, sorry. Um, and now the uh, this minus minus input will overwrite this default. And anything within the param scope here, so the params.input, I can do on the command line with minus minus input. Or I could have, this could be called whatever I want. And so I can very, very easily overwrite the defaults, which is specified within the config. And now anyone can run this pipeline with any input file name without having to change the pipeline code. And so by using these parameters and by leveraging the built-in support that Nextflow has for software containers and software management and compute infrastructures, 
we can have a single pipeline, which changes very little, but can be used by pretty much anyone on any compute infrastructure uh, in a very flexible, powerful way. If all this has gone kind of a bit over your head, don't worry about it too much. The key take home messages really here are that if you use Nextflow to run pipelines, they are very, very reproducible. Um, especially if you use the built-in interaction with GitHub, um, you can run the same pipeline code with the same software requirements every time. And even if you can go back in time and run a pipeline that you wrote two years ago, and as long as you specify the same version, Nextflow should give almost perfectly reproducible results. And you can also see exactly what you wrote. Also, Nextflow has really good logging. So it will log everything it ran. You'll have all the commands, all the flags, all the software versions. Um, and so very, very reproducible. Um, and also massively portable between different systems, which means that other people can rerun the analysis you did on their systems. And also people can collaborate on writing workflows. How am I doing on time? Right. I'm going to quickly pop out into a very, very tiny live demo just on this point, because <clears throat> I think it's quite interesting to see how is Nextflow doing all of this kind of under, under the hood? What does this actually look like? So I'm going to run a, a super, so this is an Xflow website, by the way, you can xflow.io, you can kind of check out all the details about how to install it, and you've got all the, all the documentation under it. Um, well, the simplest example to run with Nextflow is called uh, Nextflow Hello. So I'm in a, in a test directory here, there's nothing in here. I can do Nextflow run hello, <coughs> or I could even do, uh, make it a bit more obvious, Nextflow io slash and now here this is the name of a github repository so user or organization and repository name which matches nextflow hello here on github i could also give the full github url if i wanted to that would work fine so running this will tell nextflow go and find this repository on the web on github get the code and run that code if i go into main.nf which is the default file name if not specified you can see the workflow here is very, very simple. It's basically the same as what I just showed in my slides. You've got a single process with an input and output and a little bash script. And here we've got a, an input channel and you can see there's one, two, three, four elements, which are just different strings being supplied as the input here and they're being passed onto this process. And then at the end, we've got a view, which just means it's just gonna print the results to the, to the terminal. So because I've got four different inputs here, Nextflow should be clever enough to run this process four times. So let's see what happens. Nextflow run hello. It's got the GitHub URL here. And sure enough, it's run on the local executor, which means it's running on my laptop. <coughs> uh, four processes uh, called say hello, and it's done four out of four times. And these are the results, which you can kind of see make sense from here. Where did it run those files? If I look in the home in the directory I'm working in now, uh, you'll see there's a directory now called work, which is the default file name. And if I start looking into um, the work directory, you can see that there is four subdirectories. And in fact, uh, if I look in there, you can see there's these are, uh, these are called the work um, directories. So for every time a process runs, it's called a task. And every task has its own isolated directory that it runs in. And so if I look into the file contents of this one task, you can see there's a bunch of files that Nextflow has created here. Um, maybe the, the most interesting one then is probably command.sh. And that is the kind of resolved bash script here or resolved script. Um, it could be, yeah, it could be other language as well. And here you can see it says, instead of uh, $x, which is the variable, you can see that's been resolved into, in this case, chow. And if I do cat work star star command, but sh, you'll see that there's four different scripts here and they've been each resolved into these, each of these variables. So that's what Nextflow ran. And there's actually it ran this .command.run file. If I'd run this on Slurm, this file then would have had all the sbatch headers and everything and would have submitted the job to the cluster and had all that extra overhead. So this is really, really nice because as Nextflow runs each task in its own isolated directory, there's no kind of interference with anything else that's going on. It doesn't matter what the file names are, you're not gonna overwrite stuff. Um, in fact, Nextflow basically doesn't really care what input and output file names are. It only really cares about the variables within these channels. Uh, and so things are really nicely isolated and kind of clean. That's what Nextflow did. Um, and just quickly, I can also do Nextflow run hello, and I can, well, I can see what jobs I've run in this directory. So if I do Nextflow log, 
you can see I've got one job here and this is the command that was run. Uh, and I can do next flow run hello minus resume. And next flow should be clever enough to see that I've already read, run this pipeline in this directory. Sure enough, it says it's cached, it's reused the outputs of four steps which I ran in the previous workflow. So it just hasn't, re, hasn't rerun these commands just now, it's found the previous results and reused them. <laughs> and finally, I can also go to this repository on GitHub and see it's got a couple of tagged releases here. Uh, and so if I wanted to, I could do next flow run hello and I could do minus R and specify V1.1. And that would tell Nextflow to fetch this specific version of this pipeline. Uh, it could also use a branch as well instead of releases and stuff. And this way, this is where the reproducibility aspect comes in, is if you go back and run a previous version of a pipeline where all the software versions were hard-coded into that pipeline code, Nextflow will run that exact version of the pipeline and the, those exact versions of the software and basically should give you exactly the same outputs that it did whenever you run it before. Really, really reproducible in a really, really easy, traceable way. Right. That was next flow. Shout out if you have any questions about how that works. Otherwise, I will <laughs> head into sort of the next section, uh, which is NF Core. So, NF Core is kind of a sister project to Nextflow, which, which I founded when I was working at the NGI together with a couple of other folks. Um, and basically what happened was we were using Nextflow within our genomics facility. We were building these pipelines and we wanted them to be reusable because that was one of the aims was that people who got the data from us, they could rerun the same analysis and get the same results, or they could add in additional samples and they could use the pipelines that we had written for ourselves, they could use for, for themselves as well. And that started happening and it was great. But what took me by surprise was that other people started using our workflow outside of Sweden who had nothing to do with us. They just found them on GitHub, they did what they needed. And because Nextflow gives such a high degree of portability, works on anyone's system, they could take these workflows that we were building at the NGI and use them for their own purposes. And this happened more and more and more until eventually we thought, this is crazy, there's, there's no sense to be calling this like SciLife Lab NGI pipelines, we should rebrand this as NF Core and try and build a community where we're working together on a single cohesive set of uh, workflows. And so that's what NF Core is. NF Core is a community. It's a community effort to create a curated set of analysis pipelines all built using Nextflow, using best practices and kind of standardized guidelines. There's a few different things that you get when you come into the NF Core community, which you can use kind of out the box. The most obvious one is pipelines. Um, see if this number is still right. 73 different pipelines. I can pop onto the NF Core website here. It's NF Core with a dot, dot re. Uh, and I can go onto view pipelines here. And you can see a list of all the different pipelines which are available, which are built by the community and basically are ready for you to use straight out of the box. Yep, still 73. So if you want to do um, RNA-seq, you can type in RNA-seq and you can see we've got pipeline for RNA-seq here. Another one for small RNA-seq, uh, some single cell pipelines, things like that. And these pipelines are ready to go out of the box. So you can go here and you can read all the documentation about how to use the pipelines. Um, you can even see example results of, of the results that the pipeline generates. Uh, use that for benchmarking or just as an example. And many of the talks, of, many of the pipelines have also got short YouTube talks about describing how they work and how they were built. So, <clears throat> seventy-three different pipelines and different data types that we have pipelines that you can just use out of the box without writing yourself. Um, as the community grew, one of the things we really had to do quickly was build up a set of tools for people to use. Um, some of these tools are to help people run pipelines. Some of the tools are designed to help developers write pipelines, uh, both within NF Core, but also generally we try and be as general as possible. So you can still use these same tools to build your own pipelines, even if they'll never be part of NF Core. Uh, and also lots of tooling around testing and automation to try, try and streamline the process of making sure that pipelines are uh, basically functional uh, and following all the best practices that we, 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 we try and adhere to. So there's a large body of additional tooling around NF Core pipelines. You don't need that to run next, the pipelines. All you need is Nextflow. Um, but if you're running pipelines, especially if you're developing pipelines, this tooling helps. 
And then finally, the newest addition to the NF core community is uh, the idea of kind of components which we can collaborate on. The newer versions of Nextflow allow you to share not just entire pipelines, but also parts of pipelines, which we call modules and sub workflows. And so now, if you're building your own pipeline, you can go and look at the NF core modules page. And this, these are now at a single process level. So I had an example with FastQC earlier. You can see that we've got a, a module here for specifically just running FastQC. And this is something that you can pull into your own pipeline, use that process, and we can all collaborate on that single process. So if there's any bug fixes or changes, they can be done centrally and you can synchronize those updates with your local pipeline. Um, the same for sub workflows, which are very, very new, are still being built. So you can have a, a chunk of a pipeline which just does QC and alignment. And that might be the same in many different pipelines. And you can pull that chunk in. Everyone collaborates on a central resource there and it keeps your pipeline up to date and stops everyone reinventing the wheel. So we have massive number. This, this number is almost certainly up to date. Yeah. 722 different process wrappers now, different modules, and about, yeah. 24, 25 different sub workflows. So this is a rapidly growing part of NF Core, which basically streamlines the way that we build pipelines. Uh, and if you're building your own pipelines can also be really, really helpful. If I have time at the end, I might go into a little bit about how this works and what it looks like. Um, and then really importantly, I think it's useful to talk about how NF Core is different from some other um, kind of workflow repositories. There, there are other kind of places kicking around where you can find workflows that people have built, um, like a kind of bit like GitHub for code, but for, for, for workflows. Um, and and of course, it's a bit different to those because it's very, very strongly community based. And so if you want a pipeline to be part of NF Core, it's, it's, it's essential that you are part of that community yourself. And specifically, when you use any of our tooling, you'll see it comes up with messages saying, please come and talk to the community first before you start coding to check that uh, everyone agrees that what you're building is a good idea and fits with the community and also to get help and maybe find other collaborators. Because we don't want two people working on the same idea uh, in isolation. We want everyone to come together and work on a single pipeline that's best practice. All NF core pipelines have to use our common template, which has all the kind of boilerplate code and best practices. Uh, and that's used for automated synchronization and updates. And, and finally, this idea of collaboration, not duplication, we're very strong on. So if someone comes and says, hey, I've built this pipeline, it's great, but it's already quite similar to one we have already, basically does the same thing. We'll say, sorry, we've already got a pipeline that does that. Uh, we only want one pipeline per data type analysis type. And so that means when you come and look for RNA-seq, there is just one pipeline that does RNA-seq. You don't have to think about which one you want. And if someone says, "I but this one's missing this feature, you say, well, great, add that feature to the pipeline we have already. And that way we get the maximum number of people collaborating on a single set of pipelines. Really powerful idea and quite different to many other kind of repositories for workflows. Um, having said that, I kind of touched on this, the, the tools we build, we try to make as generic as possible. So if you're working on something and you think this is never going to be part of NF core because uh, this pipeline is super specific to my institute, it would never be reused by anyone else. Or you know, I can't because I'm working at a company and it can't be open source. Don't ignore NF core for that reason, because we try and make our tools work for anyone, uh, which means that you can still use the NF core template to build your own pipeline, even if it's never going to be part of NF core. That's fine. It's designed to work like that way. The schema tools, the launch tools, these, these kind of different tools we built around in the ecosystem are designed to work on any Nextflow pipeline, not just NF core pipelines. And even if you can't collaborate on whole pipelines, it might be possible that you can use these, these modules, these components, and collaborate on a component level and, and pull them into your pipeline. So it's a really, really fun community to be part of, and, and you can collaborate on many different levels. To give you uh, an idea of what the community looks like uh, a few days ago, <laughs> um, uh, just roughly how many people we are and everything, we are now at over 4,000 people on the NF Core Slack. So if you're not familiar with Slack, it's like a chat app, so um, direct messaging on the web. And this is the primary place where we communicate everything for the NF Core community. So a huge number of people all working together. Um, and we have, yeah, one and a half thousand people who have contributed something, whether it be a bug report or code via GitHub, 
Um, so we have and hundreds of people who are regular active members of the GitHub organization. We have over 90 different repositories and tens of thousands of commits and, and pull requests. So NF Core has really grown into a massive community uh, with a huge body of work behind it. Um, and that's really one of the strengths of Nextflow and NF Core now, I think. If you want to use these workflows, it's a really good place to get help. You can try playing around with uh, the RNA seq or the, I don't know, whichever pipeline you want. And if you have any troubles at all or just want to know where to get started, you can hop onto the NF Core Slack. And pretty much day or night, there are people there uh, online and you can pop into every single pipeline has its own channel within Slack. So you can pop onto a channel for that pipeline and say, hey, I'm having trouble. Or I don't understand this. And there'll be someone there to answer your questions pretty quickly. Generally. So that community aspect is really, really valuable. You're not you know, by no means on your own. And there's lots of people around who are really enthusiastic about helping uh, and getting you up to speed. And this slide is a bit outdated, but it shows roughly the geographic distribution of where um, where our community are based. And this is based on who's looking at the NF Core website. So you can see we, we came out of Europe, so there's, there's a heavy presence in Europe and, and, and the US. Uh, quite a lot of people now in, in, in Asia and, and uh, Australia. And uh, you guys in South America are a bit of a bit of a weak spot. So <laughs> I'm hoping that we, this really gets you fired up and gets you excited to work with these tools because we, we'd love a bigger presence in Latin America. And, and Marcel on the call here, it's his, his mission to try and make this as easy and usable for, for everyone as possible. And I think we even have a, a Slack channel within NF Core now dedicated to Latin America to try and foster sort of a, a more of a community for, for, for your region. Um, and NF Core had uh, both both Nextflow and NF Core have their own uh, Nature Biotech papers. So if you're interested, go and check it out. It's quite a short paper, the NF Core one, back in 2020. Parts of it are out of date now, but it's quite an easy read and gives you a, a bit of a backstory for why we built the community and how we structured it, um, and lots of information about how we decided on different different aspects. How am I doing on time? All right, I'm going to quickly dive into another live demo because I think I've got a little bit of time. So hopefully you're still with me. Um, this time I am uh, going to make a pipeline. <laughs> so now I'm going to switch for a little gear a little bit from kind of running pipelines that other people have made. Hopefully I've shown you that all of these pipelines are kicking around here. I can do Nextflow, run NF Core, RNA seq. I can also do just profile test docker and that would run the mini test data set for RNA seq pipeline on my laptop using docker which I've got running up here these commands here are over here so you can see dead easy to get up and running with these pipelines that's all I need Nextflow knows where to find this pipeline on the NF core community uh, and run it and all the usage documentation here explains how to actually run the pipeline for real okay so that's how to run but I want to make my own pipeline and I want to quickly demonstrate how some of these developer tools are super powerful for building pipelines. So we have this helper tool called NF Core, which is different to X Nextflow. And these uh, this provides these kind of helper commands to get you up and running, um, both for people using pipelines here. So you could list the available pipelines. Uh, it's got a command line interface for launching pipelines. Maybe I could mention that one as well. So on the NF Core website, any pipeline you can see has this launch button which gives you a nice interactive graphical form for all of the different inputs that the pipeline supports together with help text. Uh, and you can see there's some of them are required, some of them have uh, validation. Uh, so if I try and hit launch, it will complain that that doesn't look like an email address. So there's rich graphical interfaces for launching all of these pipelines. Um, and uh, if I just do minimal, I think that's the only required option here can hit launch and it gives me a command here which I can just launch that pipeline with everything I just put into the graphical interface uh, here on the command line or I can go through to tower which I'm going to talk about in a second so there's helper tools for running pipelines and then there's also these commands for building pipelines so I'm going to create a new pipeline from scratch called what should I call it demo uh, demo pipeline bill and I'm not going to customize anything this time uh, it reminds me to come and talk to the NF Core community. And then uh, if I have uh, a look in VS Code, I have a bit of an explore of some of the files it's just created for me uh, in, this, in this folder. And you can see 
a bunch of files here. These are all boilerplate. Uh, but the important ones are things like main.nf. This is the main Nextflow workflow. And you can also see it's created a pipeline with a few uh, shared modules, which is like the FastQC one I was talking about. And here you can see we've got FastQC input, output, and the FastQC command slightly buried. Um, so nothing very fancy here. It's kind of quite a lot of code wrapper stuff that you have to kind of dig through a little bit. Um, but once you get used to reading this code, it's, it's not too bad. And you can see this single command has then created a fully functional workflow for me. And I could run this now and it would, it would work. But at the moment, it just has um, it just has um, FastQC and MultiQC, and that's about it. And say I want to add something else. Um, let's have a look. I've just been working with DNA methylation pipeline, and I've been using a module called Bismarck Align, which does bisulfite sequencing data alignment. So I can do NFCore modules install. Um, Oh, I need to do it in the in the directory I created. Try again. Oh, ah, yes. Don't you love live demos? <laughs> okay, that's not gone well. Um, I'll try one more time. Bismarck align. There we go. So what should have happened, the nature of live demos, my apologies, is it should have given me some really nice uh, kind of interactive prompts talking about what pipeline, what modules were available and suggesting things as I've gone along. But because I know the exact name, I've just read it off here. Um, you go, and of course modules install Bismarck Align. I just use that and it tells exactly which module to add. And then if I do git status in this uh, the repository of the, the pipeline I've created, you can see it's actually fetched the files for this module, which are in here. And again, this is my pre-written uh, process here together with the Bismarck command. This particular one has a bunch of logic about how to parallelize it. It has the exact uh, Docker container and singularity container and Conda image to use with the latest versions of Bismarck. Um, and I get all of this for free, uh, which is super cool. And it e even tells me how to include this module into my pipeline code. So what I need to do then is copy this bit of text, which has been spat out, put that into my workflow file and match up the channels. And I can also then do NFCore modules. Uh, you can see there's a bunch of other commands to work with these, such as um, update. So if I did NFCore modules update, it would pull down any new updates that other people have contributed to the modules in my pipeline and just patch them straight onto them. So it's really, really powerful, fast way to build solid pipelines, uh, which is really fun and exciting. Okay. Right, I'm gonna wrap on and go on to the kind of final part of my talk now, which is just a couple of minutes at the end. <laughs> uh, if you're interested in all this stuff about the community aspect, please do come and join us and um, check out the website that NFCore um, join, it was a big button up the top right that says join, which is what that URL is. Uh, and you can see there's a button here to join our Slack community. So just hit that, uh, sign up with your email address and you'll be able to pop in and chat to us all um, anytime. And there's a Twitter account to follow and even a Mastodon. Um, the final part of my talk I want to talk about is a, a, a product which comes out of Secura, which is a spin out company around Nextflow uh, called Nextflow Tower. And Nextflow Tower is a is an effort to give um, kind of a two things really a graphical interface to running and monitoring Nextflow workflows, and it's called Tower because it's meant to be like kind of an overview of all the different workflows that you might have going on uh, at your in your group, in your institute, etc., in your company. Um, you can check it out on the web. It's um, if you go to tower.nf, you find its own website or you can find it via the Secura website as well. And this of course tells you all about it in much more detail, uh, lets you sign in. Um, but basically uh, Tower gives you this, this kind of overview of, of workflows that you're running. You can monitor them there, you can launch and you can manage them and you can share runs between different teams. So even if you launched your workflow, you can share its progress with someone else in your team. Um, and really importantly, it's very clever about working with a cloud. So if you're using the cloud, this, I really recommend using Tower because uh, Tower has a function called, uh, on AWS at least, a, a function called AWS Forge. And you set up a minimal kind of set of permissions for Tower to use and it will create 
all of the AWS infrastructure that it needs to run, which can take quite a lot of time. So all those batch queues, all that kind of stuff, Tower can create for you, uh, which is a massive time saver, speaking from experience of having done it manually before Tower was able to do this. Um, so I can just quickly show you what this looks like, sign in with GitHub. Um, and here you can see this, these are the NF core tests. <coughs> uh, so we have an organization for NF core and we do all these automated tests for every pipeline. Um, so I showed you very quickly hit results here and you can see all these results, which automatically run every time we have a pipeline release, the pipeline runs a full version of the, um, of the pipeline on, on a full like published data set using, using Tower here. And you can see all the different runs that we've done in the organization. And if I go in and look at Sarek, Sarek is the pipeline for doing uh, DNA sequencing analysis. So calling variants and doing cancer normal or just working purely on, on a germline sample. And it tells me about uh, how the pipeline was launched. I can see the execution log, hopefully, if it's not too old, um, which, okay, it's probably maybe a bit old. It gets deleted after a couple of days. Um, and shows me all the details of what ran, how many jobs ran. So you can see there's 781 different tasks which were executed and they all succeeded, how long it took, and loads of um, statistics about CPU usage, uh, memory usage, and so on. And I can also go into any specific task. Uh, here we've got FastQC and it tells me exactly what the command was that was used. Uh, if this was a more recent run, <laughs> it would have the execution log. Um, with all the standard out generated from that process, but AWS has cleaned that up automatically because we're quite aggressive with that with our setup. That's specific to our setup on AWS. And tells, but Tower also tells us how long it took to run and all these details. So it's a purely graphical interface. And also because it works with teams, uh, we can have teams set up within uh, an organization with different levels of permissions. So you can have sysadmins who maybe set up all the AWS credentials. And then people within the team running Nextflow workflows who never need to know or see those credentials because they're all managed via Tower. So Nextflow Tower is a really powerful kind of tool for running Nextflow. Uh, and it, you don't need it for Nextflow, but it's like an added layer on top. Um, Nextflow Tower has a few different ways you can run it. There's a, a community version, which is a bit behind, but we're hoping to get that back up to up to parallel, up to speed with the other versions soon, which you can download and install yourself. The one that most people will get started with is cloud, which is the one I've just been using here. You can just log in uh, for free and there's two different tiers. You can have some kind of personal usage basically for free or institutional usage you can you can pay for. Um, and then there's also a commercial offering uh, for an uh, enterprise level if you want to have your own version, which you have installed on your own systems behind firewalls and, and whatnot. Um, yeah, and you can find out more information at the Tower website. With that, I'm going to wrap up a couple of things to mention. Um, quite recently, back in October, we had the Nextflow Summit, uh, which you can check out the website there, summit.nextflow.io. Uh, it was a, an amazing event with lots of really, really interesting talks about different pipelines, different infrastructures, different clouds, all kinds of stuff, as well as a bunch of new features about Nextflow itself. Everything was live streamed to the web, and all of the talks are on YouTube, and you can find them all through that website. Um, we also have some events coming up. Uh, we have a free open training who anyone can attend in March next year. And I believe that Marcel is gonna be running a track in Portuguese, if that's interesting. And we'll also have a track running in Spanish and English. Um, so that will be a, hopefully a really, really helpful resource. This is the first time we've tried to run training in different languages. My hope is it makes it a lot more accessible for people who are not very comfortable with English. Um, so next flow training and then of course training in March, please do join. Uh, it should be really fun. We did our first one uh, just before the summit in October. We expected, I expected somewhere between 50 and 60 people to sign up and we had 800. <laughs> so we were slightly taken aback by how much interest there was in that. Uh, but it gives me really high hopes for the next one in March that we're going to have a lot of people interested and we'll have lots of people on hand to answer questions and help you through the exercises. Uh, and then after the training in March, we also have uh, the next NF Core Hackathon. Uh, this is going to be entirely online, this event. So we'll, we'll join via a, a platform called Gather Town. But this time, we're also trying something new. We're encouraging people to have local get togethers and then so kind of book out a meeting room at your institute, get a bunch of people together in that meeting room where you can have a bit of an in person presence and help each other out. And then also join online with everyone else across the world doing the same thing. 
free to join. It'd be great to have you there, beginners and everyone. Um, just as long as you've done the training beforehand, so you're not a complete beginner, you should be in a good place to, to get, get involved. And with that, I will stop talking. <laughs> and please uh, ask me any and all questions and I'll be happy happy to help. Thanks, Phil. It was a great talk. Very, very nice talk. People are really happy according to the message that I see. Uh, we have a few questions. We have two questions from Vinicius. I'm going to read it out loud so that people on the recording can know what the question was. Uh, so he said, hello, Philip. Thank you so much for your lecture. If I understood correctly, I can view the pipeline for genomics analysis on, or any other type and submit it to NFCore for execution using Nextflow. So this, do you want to answer this? Yeah, we, so or, okay. it's, not, it's not quite right. So basically, um, NFCore is a community and people put pipelines, build pipelines as part of the community and make them available. And they, they sit on GitHub up here. If you want to run an, an NFCore pipeline, you don't run it on NFCore, you run it on your system, be it your laptop, your HPC, your cloud, whatever you fetch the code from NFCore and you run it locally. So as someone running a pipeline, you don't have to join the Slack, you don't have to join the community, you can just grab a pipeline and run it. If you want to contribute a pipeline, if you want to write your own pipeline and make it available for other people to use, then you come and talk to the community and you, you know, work with us to pushing your code onto NFCore. But it's just code, you don't do any execution. Same also with Tower, that's something that confuses people with Nextflow Tower. You use your own compute infrastructure and that's the same ethos that runs through this whole thing. You use your own laptop, your own HPC, your own cloud, and you're not kind of locked into anything. It's using the same infrastructure that you would normally use. Hopefully that's cool. clear. Yep. So Vinicius also asked another question. He said, uh, Nextflow can run any language, such as Python, Bash, or do I have to use a Nextflow specific language? So the workflow, the way that the workflow is built, where you define processes, link the channels, that has to be written using Nextflow. Nextflow is built on top of a language called Groovy. You don't really need to know Greasy very much. You just need to read the Nextflow documentation. For simple pipelines, the, simple, the, the grammar is quite simple. I showed you an example. We've got process, input, output, and everything. That part has to be in, a, in Nextflow language. The processes themselves, the code that's run, that can be in any language. So you can have a Python script, which runs an analysis. You can have a Bash script, an R script, whatever. The bit within a process, that can be any language. But the way you connect the, the processes together into a workflow, that's written using the Nextflow language. So, Phil, I like to say that the Nextflow language is used to describe your pipeline, but everything else is whatever you, you want. So if you have like a few softwares and some Python scripts and best scripts, you just wrap them with Nextflow and you can describe your pipeline. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. So, João Vitor mentioned that uh, he wasn't aware of the NFCore modules. He's really happy about it. Uh, is the whole boilerplate you showed when creating a demo workflow necessary for using the NFCore modules? Or is there a simpler way or template for creating workflows that can also take advantage of the modules? And then complementing a bit the question of, of Ron Vitor, I would like you to, to speak a bit about sub workflows after you answer this question. Yeah. Um, so short answer is, Yes, you can have, you can use NFCore modules with a much more stripped down version if you would like. Uh, the only absolute requirements for using NFCore modules are you have to have a .NFCore YAML file in your root of your, of your pipeline, which basically just tells NFCore that this is a repository and it's a pipeline. It's like literally one line of YAML. Uh, and you have to use the directory structure that NFCore exists, uh, expects to hold those modules. So they have to be in a folder called modules, NFCore, FastQC. Uh, and finally, you also have to have a modules.json file, which NFCore helper tools use to track what versions of modules are installed so it knows when there are updates available. Um, but all the other stuff, like the changelog file, the GitHub continuous integration testing, the stuff with code formatting, like we've got loads of boilerplate code in there, which you don't have to have to use NFCore modules. Having said that, if you can get over the fear of having lots of <laughs> files kind of polluting your pipeline when you get started, once you've kind of got to grips with that, that we have, so we have a weekly seminar talks uh, within NFCore called NFCore Bite Size, which are all on YouTube. There's a YouTube talk dedicated to talking through all the different files and what they are. But the vast majority of them, you never need to touch. Uh, they're just kind of helper tools. 
Uh, so if you can if you can cope with having them there, then I would generally just say use a template and just ignore them. They can be useful in a bunch of different examples. Like if you want to develop the pipeline using a service called Gitpod, then there's a config file for using that. So you, you spin up Gitpod and it's got everything ready for you there. So that all the files are there for a reason, uh, hopefully fairly generalizable. But yes, you don't need to use the NF core template to use NF core modules. You just have to have a couple of prerequisites. Sub workflows is pretty much the same story. You need the same .NF core YAML file. You need uh, the same modules.json file, and you need uh, the directory structure modules and sub workflows. But what um, are sub workflows? Right. Uh, let me show you. So if I hop into the RNA seq pipeline here. Um, and you can see this is all the boilerplate code here. Like most of them, we don't really care about. We've got the modules.json file, which I mentioned. So again, this is automatically written, so you'd never write this by hand, but you can see it lists all the modules which were installed, where they came from, which branch, and what commit they came from. So that's how NF Core helper tools knows what, what's there and what should be updated. Uh, we have the NF Core.yaml file, which just says like, this is a pipeline. That's what you need. And then we've got the directory structure here for modules and sub workflows. If I look in sub workflows, then you can see these NF Core shared sub workflows. These are installable by anyone for any pipeline. And there's one called, excuse me, there's one called um, Align HiSAT2. If I look at this, this is basically like a mini workflow. Uh, it includes some modules, which are single processes. So it's got an alignment and it's sorting with SAM tools. And this particular workflow then takes some input channels um, and it runs a HiSAT2 alignment and then it sorts and indexes the results. And then it has a bunch of output files which it emits for downstream use. And so this sub workflow can then be used by, let's see if I can find it. Um, HiSAT2. So it can be imported and then Hopefully somewhere down here. Oh, I don't know. I can't find it. Align HiSAT2. I think that was the name of the workflow. Uh, and so this is a sub workflow, which is running several processes. Uh, and here we're giving it some input files and running it basically. And so it's just, I don't want to get too much into the details here, but basically it's, it's a way of, you've got kind of a hierarchy of structure. You've, at the simplest level, you've got modules, which are a single process. So a single step in your pipeline, and we can collaborate and share those. At the top end, we've got entire workflows. We've got the RNOC pipeline, and we can collaborate and share that whole pipeline. And then some sub workflows are in between. They're like chunks of pipeline. So you might have the same kind of four steps, like JTK or something. It's used in like five different pipelines. We can share that little chunk as a sub workflow. Hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, that's great. So I have a question. So you have this NF Core RNA seq pipeline, for example. Uh, mm -hmm. And by looking at the documentation in the website, you have all the documentation about it, the context, the usage, uh, and it shows that it does all the quantification and everything, but it stops there. So let's say that I want to do differential expression analysis, for example. So correct me if I'm wrong. I could fetch this repository with this RNA, with this RNA seq pipeline. I could modify it, like fork it and modify it, installing a module for NF Core that does differential expression analysis, and I could use it. Yeah. Generally, we I would say don't if you can avoid it, don't get a copy of the RNA pip pipeline and edit it to run it locally. Because as soon as you do that, any future updates are much more difficult to uh, use because mm -hmm. you can't pull in the changes that uh, on top of your change, so it, it can be difficult to. So generally, I so and um, there's that's part one. Just as kind of a side note, differential expression has been uh, a discussion about whether that should be part of the RNA pipeline for since before NF Core existed, <laughs> uh, since since about two weeks after I first wrote the RNA pipeline about ten years ago, um, and the reason it's not there is because it's very difficult to generalize that uh, and have it run differential expression in a way which is valid for everyone running the pipeline because people run it on such a myriad of different experimental setups. So many of the NF core pipelines, because we try and make them as general as possible, do stop a bit before that kind of downstream analysis that you'll typically need for your, your, um, your paper or your analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and so generally what people do is they run RNA seq pipeline for the bulk processing or that heavy handling of, of data sets. And then you have your matrix 
uh, outputs, then you can just load those into R and write your own differential expression analysis. That being said, there is currently a new pipeline in development called differential expression. Uh, because this has been requested so much and some people in the community have finally sort of decided that this can be handled within a pipeline in a way that's generalizable and useful. So looking forward to a few months in the future, you'll be able to run the RNA-seq pipeline, get those results, and then run a differential expression analysis pipeline and get your differential expression analysis results. That's great, you know, very nice. Would you say that NextFlow is becoming or is already an industry standard for pipelines? Yeah, I mean, I'm biased. <laughs> I'm wearing the hoodie. <laughs> so I, I have to say that, really. Um, I mean, yeah, I think there are a number of um, a number of different... We, we, in this seminar series, you've had a talk about Cromwell already, uh, which has a lot of similarities. Uh, there's Snakemake, uh, CWL, and the different tools that run CWL. There's, there's several different tools in the ecosystem which do similar things, and especially if you start looking beyond bioinformatics, there are other tools in in kind of more generalized fields doing similar-ish things. So you have plenty of options. Um, I think at NextFlow um, is, for many people, a really good solution. It's very, very scalable. So you can start with five samples and keep running the same pipeline when you've got 100,000 samples. So it scales very well. It's got really good support across a massive range of infrastructures, local, HPC, cloud. That's why I started using it however many years ago is because we were running on HPC and I knew one day we'd want to run the same workflows on the cloud. Um, and it's got a very, very strong community. So those are kind of three reasons I think the next flow is a really good choice. And I mean, yeah, is I'm not sure if I'd go as far as to say it's an industry standard, but it's being used by a lot of people um, in industry. I mean, uh, the Secure customer list, I, can, I think I can have a feeling it's listed on the homepage so I don't have to say anything I'm not meant to uh, <laughs> but um you can see there's like a bunch of uh, kind of major companies yeah okay it doesn't list so many but uh, there's a lot of major pharmaceutical companies and other companies working in industry using Nextflow for their production workflows and there are many hundreds and hundreds of institutes and, and companies doing this so it's got a massive user base it's very nice to hear so does anyone else have a question so i see on youtube there are not new questions and here also does anyone want to make a comment ask anything feel free mm, let me see if i have a question oh so i think one thing that's very interesting for people who already started working with this pipeline with this pipeline orchestration tools uh, sometimes they're very strict so can i have optional inputs or and optional outputs in next law can it have like branching conditions can it decide to do different things during runtime Yes, and actually that leads on very nicely from the previous question because NextFlow is very well suited for doing this. Um, and it's one of the main things that actually differentiates it against other workflow tools. Um, some other workflow tools, um, SnakeMake being the obvious one, when you launch it, it calculates the entire kind of tree of tasks for whole DAG. Whereas NextFlow figures it out as it goes along, it has a push model. So it only looks at what the next step will be when it finishes the previous one. This means that you can have logic as you run uh, as a simple example, the RNA I can't remember if it still does it anymore. The RNA seq pipeline certainly used to look at the log files from alignment. And if there are any samples that had under 5% of reads aligned, it would cut them out from a downstream analysis on the fly because we knew that they would just crash the pipeline. So you can have built in logic. You can also have uh, recursive loops, um, things like this, like iterations within your pipeline. So NextFlow can figure out what the DAG should look like as it goes along, which is really, really powerful. <laughs> um, and what was the first part of the question? Optional inputs and outputs. Um, simple answer, yes. Longer answer is it depends slightly. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but generally, yes. Um, if you kind of, it depends exactly on what you're thinking about, but I mean, for an example, many of the genomics pipelines we have use a reference genome to do alignment, for example. Uh, and if you run them, the minimum requirement would be to run the pipeline with just a faster file, and then the pipeline will generate the reference index on the fly. Uh, it will build the index for you. But if you supply the, the pre-built index, then it will skip those steps and it will just use whatever you've given it to, to save time. So that's kind of an, an, op an optional input where if it's not supplied, mm -hmm. it will 
pipeline will generate it itself, but if it is supplied, it will just use it. Um, it depends a little bit on what the specifics are that you're thinking of, but generally, yeah, optional inputs are, are, are not a problem and complex logic within the, the pipeline. And so let's say that I use Conda to manage my bioinformatic software's packages. Does Nextflow support Conda or Docker, Singularity? Like you mentioned Singularity in Docker in the talk, but are these all these two supported natively by Nextflow? Yeah, yeah. So um, not Nextflow, let me show you the documentation. So Nate, it does, does a bunch of cool stuff. Um, for, for software, it handles, um, I should say Con Conda here, there you go, Conda environments. Uh, it natively supports Conda. So within your process, you have Conda, and then you just list one or more packages that you need. Um, and when next, or you also can generate a, a Conda environment file. And when Nextflow sees this and runs with Conda enabled, uh, within the work, when, within the pipeline, it will create environments for basically each process uh, with the, whatever pro software that process needs. So it will run uh, kind of uh, use Conda natively, but without polluting your, your general Conda environments you have set up uh, on a per, per pipeline run basis. So yes, it has native integration to Conda. It will ha also has native integration for uh, Docker, um, Singularity, and Singularity is nice because it can use the Docker containers. So if you build a Docker container, it will basically work with all other types of container technology, Podman, Shifter, and Charlie Cloud. Uh, so pretty much whatever con software container system uh, you're using, Nextflow should support it natively. And Nextflow is very clever about it because it also handles all the mounting of the directories. So when it, when it runs in, uh, it will automatically have the the working directory mounted within the Docker image, um, within the Docker container. And it, you can add, there's a special bin directory within a pipeline where you can add scripts and that bin directory is automatically on the path and those scripts are automatically available. So Nextflow makes it very easy to work with Docker containers. And in fact, much easier than it would be without Nextflow um, to the extent that I, I make Nextflow pipelines even for very trivial things just because it means I don't have to think about all the different Docker flags. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it's got really deep integration with, with Docker and, and these other software systems. Um, and it also has, you, you didn't ask this, but I think it's really cool. Nextflow also has integration with different file systems as well. So on a simple basis, it works with just normal POSIX file systems. Um, but also if you give um, Nextflow an input file, which is a, an HTTP link or an FTP link or an Amazon S3 link, Nextflow is clever enough to recognize them and actually stage those files for you, uh, which is really, really cool. So you can uh, you can say like, yeah, here's, here's my S3 path. Um, and I want to just like, you can just treat it as if it's a regular file object. And Nextflow will automatically fetch that file from S3, it will stage it into your work directory where your script is running and it will be there to use. And if you specify a published here, so say I want to publish all my results to an S3 bucket, then Nextflow again will pub, will save, push all of those objects into your S3 storage, um, which is really, really powerful. And again, abstracts away a lot of the complexity that you might have with working with different file systems. And so if you, uh, if you go to test data sets, you can look at like an example test data set that we run with the RNA seq pipeline here. Uh, if I go to sample sheets, <laughs> you can see that the sample that these files that we're downloading here are HTTP links coming from GitHub. And if I look at the, the full one for the large scale data sets, you can see they're being pulled from S3. And when you run the pipeline, you don't have to care about the fact that these are all different data sources. Nextflow just handles all that for you uh, and will just stage those files automatically. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that's very, very nice, very nice. So do, do you have any last message, Phil? So I think we are done with the questions. So if you have any message you want to to, to give to the audience before we end this recording, feel free. Yeah, come, come and use Nextflow, use NFCore, get involved, um, jump on <laughs> NFCore Slack, come and chat to us. Uh, we'd love to hear more questions. We'd love to hear about your use cases, uh, help you get up and running. Um, and uh, yeah, basically we're a really welcoming, fun community. So uh, I hope to see many of you around. So thank you, Phil. Thank you, thanks everyone for for joining us today. I think that's it. I think uh, at some point Miguel is going to stop the recording, but I think we can uh, be done with that. Okay. So bye bye everyone. Bye Phil. Thanks again for coming. Thanks. Bye bye.